Verse 12. It is a horrible thing for a king to do evil. You see, this is connected with verse 11. The Lord demands fairness. And you call yourself a king because Jesus has made us kings and priests unto God the Father. Well, if you're a king, it's a horrible thing for a king to be unfair in a business deal. Think of that. That's terrible. It's an abomination for kings to go around cheating someone. His right to rule in, it, in, in the millennium when Jesus comes depends upon his fairness now. Depends upon his throne is established on righteousness. In other words, God doesn't give me the right to rule in the millennium if he found that during my time on earth I was not absolutely honest. That's how a lot of people are going to lose their throne. There are many instances in the Old Testament of kings of Judah and Israel who lost their throne. God removed it from them, beginning with Saul. And all this is written for our instruction, that if we are faith, unfaithful, God will take away the throne from us. No, we can't automatically assume that we're going to sit on the throne when Jesus comes. That throne is established on righteousness, it says. And that's why he is testing on the earth today. In an unrighteous world, let me see who all will be righteous. Those are the people who are fit to rule in that new kingdom where righteousness is at home. As we read in Second Peter 3. Verse 13. Righteous lips are the delight of kings. And he who speaks right is love. We can look at God as a king here. And that God delights, God as a king of the universe, delights in righteous lips. And he who speaks what is right is loved by the king of the universe. So that is something we can long for, that the king of the universe should love us. And he loves those who speak what is right. Notice in the book of Proverbs how what a fantastic emphasis is placed on the tongue. There is no Old Testament book which speaks so much about the tongue as the book of Proverbs. And that's why I say this is like a new covenant book in the middle of the Old Testament. There's a spirit of the new covenant in it. That's why it tells us to seek wisdom. It's the book of wisdom. And wisdom has such a tremendous amount to do with our speech. And that's why we've exhorted again and again the church, be careful with the words you say. Be careful with the words you say. And I want to say that especially to sisters. Because the New Testament says that women have a particular weakness in this area of becoming gossips and scandal mongers. Going around carrying tales and stories. It's a particular weakness of women. I'm not saying that. The Holy Spirit has said it. The creator who created man and woman has said that the woman's got a tendency that way. And when you see that. The woman's got to be more careful. Just like men are tempted more in the area of sex than women are, in the same way women are tempted much more in the area of their tongue. That is their weak spot. And then you've got to be careful. Just, got, just like the man's got to be careful with his eyes, the woman's got to be careful with her tongue. It's just another part of the body she's got to be more careful with. But there are specific weaknesses like this in men and women. And so that's a word particularly that sisters should take care of, that God loves those who have so disciplined their tongues as to speak what is right and good at all times. Verse 14. The wrath of a king is as messengers of death, but a wise man will appease it. And we can look at it like this, that the king, you can say, is your boss in your office, let's say. And a wise man will know how to handle a situation when the boss is angry. Here's the wrath. You find your unconverted boss in the office is full of wrath one morning. Wrath is strong as messengers of death. But if you're a wise man, that's where your wisdom is tested. You go there and you see him like this. And your, your God gives you wisdom to cool him down. Think of that. Think of that ministry that we can have. Uh, in the heathen offices in the city. That's a tremendous thing. You need to take that seriously. A wise man will know how to quieten that wrath. Yeah. That's wisdom. Verse 15. There we see our need and our lack of wisdom. The 
we can cry out to God. Verse 15. In the light of a king's face is life. And his favor is like a cloud with a spring rain. We can think again of God as the king of the universe. And in the light of his face, that means his favor and his presence and the fact that he uh, looks upon us with favor, there is life there. And God's favor is like a cloud with a spring rain that waters the parched ground. Many believers are like the parched dry fields. They haven't got the rain. It's not green and fresh. But it says here, when God's favor and presence, uh, God's favor is upon us as we stand in his presence, that's like the cloud with the spring rain, the latter rain, that uh, the freshness that comes through the rain of the Holy Spirit that makes us green, like a green fields, fresh in the rain. Verse 16, how much better it is to get wisdom than gold? And to get understanding is to be chosen above silver. That teaches us what we have considered many times in the book of Proverbs, that true wealth is wisdom. In other words, you want to know how rich you are? We're not to be so foolish as to calculate our bank account or our earthly assets to find out how rich we are. We are as rich as we have divine wisdom in our life. That is purity, peaceableness, gentleness, mercy, willingness to yield, impartiality, freedom from hypocrisy, and the things listed in James 3.17, marks of divine wisdom. As much as I have of those qualities in my life, I'm rich. That's where the Lord has to say to many believers, you do not know that you are poor and blind and naked. Because you have so much Bible knowledge and so much of ministry and so many gifts, able to do this, that and the other, so many talents, musical talents and other talents. You think that you are rich and you do not know that in terms of heaven's riches, you're a poor man. That's a sad thing when we live in ignorance of that. Wisdom is the true wealth, it tells us here. Very few people understand this, that it is better to get wisdom than gold. It's better to choose wisdom than silver. Think of marriages in India, where people think in terms of money. How much money is the man earning? How much money will the woman bring in marriage? Even among believers, what does it show? They haven't understood this verse. They don't think how much wisdom, divine wisdom does this man have? How much divine wisdom does this girl have? That's secondary. That is the blindness in Christendom today. And that is where the church stands like an island in the middle of this ocean of folly. Of wisdom. Seeing that these are not the main things. Verse 17. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil and he who watches his way preserves his life. The way of the upright is called a highway and it becomes a highway by departing from evil. That's all there is to it. And here it says that we have to watch that we walk on this way. In other words, we have to be on the alert. Jesus often used that word watch and pray. What does it mean to watch? It just means be on the alert. Don't go to sleep spiritually. Be on the alert. Be sensitive. Where your conscience is freaking you about that thing. Be alert. You may fall off the way altogether. If you ignore that little prick of conscience in that decision you're taking. Be on the alert about the way. And thus you can preserve your life. Be alert about your walk. Verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Before a man falls into sin, you can be sure there's some pride in him. 
Because if he didn't have pride and he was humble, God would have given him grace in that temptation. God gives his grace to the humble. Why didn't that man get grace? Grace would have made him overcome sin. Sin cannot have dominion over those who are under grace. Why didn't the man get grace in the moment of temptation? Because God saw, even if the man didn't realize it himself, some pride in him. And so we can say pride is the cause of falling into sin. That's all it says here. Pride goes before that final destruction in hell and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Like someone has said, you know that gulf which Abraham told the rich man in hell and the rich man in hell, uh, you read about in Luke 16, saw Lazarus sitting in Abraham's bosom and Abraham told the rich man, there's a big gulf between you and us. You can't cross here and we can't cross there. And what is that gulf? That gulf is pride. That's the thing that sends people to hell. Can't cross it. It's not that they killed, uh, murdered and committed adultery. We'll be surprised to see the number of murderers and thieves and adulteresses in heaven. And uh, you'll be surprised I won't be when we see bishops in hell. I hope you won't be either. They're going to be there. Lots of them, archbishops and popes. By the hundreds, there, because of their pride in their religion. Pride goes before destruction. And a haughty spirit, and you see that haughty spirit in even in so-called Christian leaders. It goes before stumbling. That's why they lose their temper and can't get victory over lust and defeated by sin. It's all because of their pride, their high thoughts about themselves. There's a thing that God detests. In the universe, it's pride. And it's worse when it is religious pride. Verse 19. It's better to be of a humble spirit. Here's the contrast to that. It's better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. In other words, brothers and sisters, mingle with the humble brothers and sisters. Don't spend your time with all the proud, haughty people of the world. Mingle with the humble brothers and sisters. Now there's a false understanding of humble in the world. Some people think humble equals poor. No, a lot of poor people are very proud. There's, there's no connection between humility and being poor. I mean materially poor. Mingle with the humble people, with the lowly people. It is better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly. Those who have small thoughts about themselves. Because we can get that spirit when we mingle with people. And we mingle with people who are proud. There's a wise man who has said that when you mingle with proud people, it's just like trying to touch tar. You know the stuff you put on the road? If you touch tar, it's so difficult to get it off your hands. Just try it sometime. Get tar on your hand and try to take it off. It's a, a fantastic job to get rid of it. He says, it's like that. If you mingle with proud people, it'll come, it'll rub off on you. And after some time, you get that spirit. So, steer clear of these haughty, proud people in the world and this high society that people want to mingle in. Avoid that. It affects your spirit. Mingle with the lowly people, with the humble people of the world. God is with them. Yeah, that's a good exhortation. Then to divide the spoil with the proud means to go and sit there for the fantastic meals that the rich proud people can offer. No. We don't want to spend our time with all this high society people and catch that spirit. It's an infection. We've got to avoid it. 